So we can start out just with introductions. My name's Sachin Jindal. I'm a fourth year medical student at Wright State University, uh, Boonshaw School of Medicine in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and then starting in a couple months as a family medicine resident up in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so very, very happy to be here and very happy for everyone that came. Thank you all for coming. And uh, my name is Peter Lorenz. I'm a fourth year medical student at Chicago Medical School at Rosalind Franklin University. Um, and like Sachin, in a few months, I will be starting a residency in combined uh, family and emergency medicine at Christiana Care in Delaware. Thanks for so being here. Will, you will be doing it all in just a few months. Um, so we're, we're both uh, splitting this presentation in half, hoping for about 20 to 25 minutes a piece. Um, but with that being said, if there's questions along the way or if people want to chime in with comments, we can keep this pretty casual. Um, feel free to raise your hand. We have someone who um, is uh, monitoring the chat um, and can uh, keep us running smoothly and let us know if there's any issues along the way. But with, with that being said, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm taking the first half of this presentation. Um, and so I'll be talking about sort of just our current healthcare system, what we have now, and then Peter will be um, kind of doing the second half and talking about single payer. Hopefully the two sides of this presentation will allow us to see sort of the issues of what we have going on now and how we view single payer as um, the most comprehensive and equitable system to move forward. So when we start out talking about our healthcare, um, the American health care system we have now, we're going to evaluate it sort of following a three pronged approach. Uh, we're looking at costs, access and outcomes. Um, and we can get started with costs. And here we go. So just just thinking about costs. Um, this is sort of one of the the key graphics that you'll see when you um, you know, study the American healthcare system, especially compared to other countries. And um, as you can probably guess, this bright red line um, in the league of its own above, um, that's the United States healthcare system. So this graph, um, just as a brief um, explanation, is looking at healthcare expenditure as a percentage of the GDP or the gross domestic product. Um, which is a measure, it's the total sum of all goods and services produced in a year in a country. So the, like I said, the United States, we're the red line at the top, uh, here hovering at about 17%. And we compare ourselves with um, countries with sort of comparable economies. We can see that we are just about doubling um, a lot of these other countries. Um, so in the year 2017, we spent about 17% of our GDP on healthcare. Uh, as an update in 2020, which isn't even on this graph, we were up to about 19.7. Um, so that's about one out of every $5 spent is going towards healthcare. So, and the other countries, you know, they're hanging out around um, in 2015, they're about looking like us, you know, seven, eight, nine to 10%. So that's a pretty significant difference between where we're at and where countries with a comparable economy are at. Um, and then breaking that down even further, we look at healthcare expenditures per person. This is in the year 2018. And we see even on this graph, we are um, kind of heads and shoulders above a lot of those same countries in the, in the last graph. Um, and just uh, important to note in this graph, especially moving forward, is that if you look at our public spending, we are sort of in line, especially with the second highest country, which is Switzerland. Um, but we are, if you just look at the public spending, the blue part, we're kind of in the same ballpark as everyone else. And then we add this, uh, this private, um, you know, the private component here, which is about $3,800. And that's kind of what bumps us up um, so far above everybody else. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the presentation goes on, but it's just a thing that's really important to pay attention to. And this slide is kind of um, illustrating a similar point. Um, so we spend about 30% more than the second highest country um, on healthcare, and we can see here we spend about 35% 35 35% of, of our payment is coming from private health insurers so that 30% that we're above is is largely private money um, and we're spending about the same um, 
in our public spending as the other countries. So that's where we do go above and beyond. Um, and it's important because we are, it's important to realize that we're not saving public money by having these private actors in our system. We're spending the same amount of public money. We just have this extra private money that we're paying into um, that's also feeding into this system. So when we see that and we see our costs are so high, um, the next sort of natural question is um, why are costs so high? And there's two large reasons, obviously, um, there's many, many reasons, but uh, first and foremost, unlike any of the other countries that we looked at, we don't have any sort of comprehensive mechanism to control costs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but also our system is extremely complex. There's even some um, healthcare writers that almost refuse to call it a system because it's so disjointed. Um, there's so many different actors working against uh, one another and with different motives. Um, so it's such a complex system that there's a lot of administrative waste and complexity just that's necessary to navigate that system. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more, just sort of setting the scene here. So this is an example that um, is kind of mind blowing when we look at price control. So um, this is just looking at the price of an MRI in the San Francisco area, MRI being, um, you know, just a type of imaging that's pretty common in healthcare. So these are all hospitals in San Francisco and we can see, or in the San Francisco area. And we can see that, you know, there's one hospital where you'd get an MRI for $475 and one where you get one for $6,221. Um, and this is for the same test. Um, so is there any real difference between the tests between the $400 and the $6,000 test? Not, not really, probably no difference at all. So how does this happen? Um, and you know, the reason that it happens is there is, there's no mechanism to stop this from happening. Um, the, you know, the, the driving uh, force between this is that people are, go are going to charge as much as they can charge to make a profit. Um, so it's interesting when we think about this, we can think about it, um, in terms of another commodity or, or how people would view a commodity like a car. Um, you know, let's say in the same town, there was new Toyotas, um, one being sold for $25,000 and one being sold for $250,000 for the same exact car on the, on different parts of town. The market would not allow this to happen um, because, you know, as a consumer and you, when you're going out to buy a car, it's not a life or death scenario. Um, you're able to kind of research the price of the car, see, you know, which is more reasonable to pay. And obviously people are going to go towards that cheaper end of the spectrum. And we can apply this same concept to even the MRI machines themselves. Um, hospitals are going to be paying about the same amount, roughly the same amount for, for MRI machines, uh, for MRI maintenance per test. The costs are going to be pretty similar, but this relationship between the market and the consumer just completely breaks down when we look at the patient because, um, you know, when patients are going to get an MRI, they're they're just doing what they're being told by their doctor. Sometimes it can be a very emergent procedure, life or death type of thing. And um, with that being said, you're not spending the time to research. No one really knows what the price of an MRI should be. Um, so people are just going to pay what the cost is, or or go get the MRI and worry about the cost later. And we can see how that just completely um, devastates this, this relationship between um, supply and demand. And um, that's, that, that creates this huge discrepancy in costs between um, the exact same tests in different locations. Um, and there's actually an interesting study in 2013 that showed that MRIs in a, in a Washington DC hospital from literally the same machine. So the same exact MRI machine in the same room would vary, the cost would vary from patient to patient um, based on the hospital's contract with that patient and their insurance or if they had insurance. So, um, you know, it doesn't vary based on medical need. It doesn't vary based on any intrinsic uh, value that the, the patient may have. It's just completely based on this contract that the patient has um, signed into. So um, it's just an interesting thing to keep in mind. And then looking at the other aspect, um, the waste and complexity, we can see here our system is extremely complex. Um, we have all these different players, all with different rules. The rules change all the time. 
some people are covered under multiple plans and people move between plans um, extremely frequently. Our plans change based on our jobs, our marital status, our education, you know, nothing to do with our health, just different factors that affect our lives. Um, so we end up having this, you know, spaghetti looking diagram of lines moving in all different directions. Um, and a, a downside of this is um, even beyond, uh, you know, the confusion and, and the vulnerable position it places patients in is we end up having hospitals and providers who devote insane amount of significantly, uh, like a significant amount of resources to navigating the system. Um, there's some hospitals who employ um, as many billers as they do nurses, because for every patient that comes in the door, they need to figure out how to navigate this system and how payment is going to occur. So it leaves patients vulnerable, confused, and it leaves us really susceptible to footing bills that you know, we didn't know we were gonna get, or we had no idea the extent of what they would be. Um, and like I said earlier, there, there's a really interesting book that I refer to a lot called Health Justice Now by Tim Faust. And he goes through sort of the history of the American um, health system and how insurance propped up. And his, one of the arguments he makes is that our, this isn't a system that was designed at all. It was a system that was made sort of piecemeal, haphazardly thrown together. Um, and, and the um, big players, you know, the hospitals and the insurance groups kind of take advantage of this um, confusion and complexity to be able to exploit for higher and higher payment. And it's also important to look at this, and Peter will talk about this a little later, but when payers are broken up into smaller and smaller groups, there's less bargaining power per payer. Um, and so that's something that um, in single payer is, is obviously addressed. And moving forward one slide, we see that the, the costs per capita in the United States, nearly $4,000 and in Canada, which has a, a little bit more of an intuitive system, closer to $1,000, so almost four, like, you know, four times more um, just dealing with the complexity based on the system we have. All right, and then next we'll talk about access. So, you know, we've already, we've talked, I've talked a lot about the costs we shoulder. And I think there's an argument to be made that these costs would be justified if uh, we had this healthcare utopia where everyone, uh, when they got sick, could see the doctor and got the care they needed and could walk away feeling confident that their lives wouldn't be you know, demonstrably changed by the cost of the care they received. But, um, you know, most sentences when you talk about the American healthcare system begin with unfortunately, and unfortunately that's not the case for us. Um, so next, sorry, I'm having, the slides are lagging a little bit, but. Yeah, so here we go. So thinking about access and choice, and, oh, oops. There we go. Um, access and choice um, and access. So there's a common talking point that with Medicare for all, um, our choices would be limited. Um, but we can see that in our current system, even people who are insured, you know, you don't have free choice and free reign in the healthcare system that as it currently runs. Um, people are limited to, you know, you're limited to your network of doctors and hospitals. Um, who've all negotiated with your insurance provider for certain fees. Um, if you, you know, make the mistake of going out of network, or if you're in a situation where you need to go out of network for uh, convenience, then you're going to be stuck with a pretty significant bill. Uh, as we talked about with the complexity, it's not easy to navigate this system. So it's not easy to determine um, what your plan covers. Um, so patients may even think they're doing their due diligence and you know, seeking out their health care and then on the back end, figure out they have this significant bill because they weren't reading their um, policies correctly. Less than half people who are employed have a choice of their insurance plan and the average insurance plans changes every 18 months. Um, and that's uh, how, about what I mentioned earlier. Our insurance is, is tied right now to our employment, um, our stage of education, marital status, family status, all these things that, again, are not directly related to our health. Um, so that leaves us with this volatile system where every change in life you're making, you know, you're, you're at the risk of being without health care. Um, and, and then this is a, just a, another 
point in this, another point to make is that our out-of-pocket expenses are increasing as well. Um, premiums are going up for both employers and employees. Um, so it's increasingly hard for people. It places an increasing burden on employers to pay these, um, you know, these skyrocketing um, premiums as well. And um, we'll talk about this a little further in the next few slides as well. So with the out-of-pocket expenses growing, we're also seeing that uninsured and uninsured and underinsured people are growing. So um, we we often hear about it like a dichotomy between insured and and uninsured, uh, but I think it's important to recognize that there's significantly more gray area um, in that in that dichotomy than you know we can often see in the statistics because um, even those who are insured, there's something you know there's another term we call underinsured. Um, and we see that 23% of Americans are underinsured, meaning that you're paying your deductibles. Uh, I mean, you're paying for insurance, but your deductibles are so high that essentially you're not reaping the benefits of having insurance. Um, so, you know, that leaves people in this gray area where they're being counted as insured, but um, not necessarily reaping all the benefits. Um, is, is the slideshow going okay? It is. I was just trying to open the chat, but when I clicked on the chat, it kept advancing the slides. Um, okay. So I've got the chat open now. I'll, I'll... Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Just want to make sure. Um, and then we can see even the number of children without coverage is increasing. So um, there's about 4 million children in the United States without insurance, which is also just a number that's pretty hard to stomach. And so the, the reason we talked about this in the last couple slides is to um, is kind of bring it home to this point that a primary driver of financial ruin is medical bills. Um, Sixty seven percent of those filing for bankruptcies attributed health care costs as a major factor and 70, 80 percent of those people had private insurance. So that's, again, pointing to the fact that although those people would be considered insured, you know, what are they getting for that money? They're still at risk of becoming bankrupt, even though they are paying into an insurance plan. 57% um, of foreclosures, so a significant majority percentage of foreclosures list medical debt as a major cause. And it's important to recognize that this is a burden of the cost of medical care and not the illness. So this is not people who become sick and because of their illness, they're unable to work, um, leading them you know, to be able to un unable to pay their bills. This is people who became sick, were treated, and then the cost of their treatment is what led them to this financial ruin, not the illness themselves. Um, so I think that's an important distinction to make. And with, you know, keeping in mind that people are becoming bankrupt at such a high clip because of, um, medical uh there we go because of medical um bills and in uh you know there's foreclosures and bankruptcies this leads to people deferring care um you know if you or someone you know went bankrupt because of a medical bill or even if you didn't go bankrupt but you went to see a doctor and were just shocked by um you know the the number that you saw on the bill the next time you're feeling sick you're going to be doing that mental calculus in your head of all right is this worth this three thousand dollar bill or is it something that i can just kind of gut out at home so um this graph is showing the percent of adults who reported you know cost related access problems in the past year so um you know having a medical problem but not visiting the doctor not filling a prescription skipping a recommended test or not getting um specialist care um, so yeah, it's just showing when there's a cost to care and when people are seeing it out of their pocketbook, they're going to defer care. When people defer care, um, your health is not being addressed. So diseases are going undetected. Um, diseases are going untreated. This leads to worse disease, um, higher morbidity, mortality, disease that's more difficult to treat, disease that's more expensive to treat. And overall just creates a system that's inhumane and it and, and honestly costs more money on the back end because by the time people are making it to the hospitals, when they finally have that medical problem that they just feel they can't ignore, it's, it's you know, um, a lot harder to treat than it would have been had they been able to go when they first were feeling ill. And it can be fatal. This can lead people to deferring care, not going to the hospital when they're having their MI and, um, you know, unfortunately having to 
um, you know, having a fatal outcome. So um, looking at the payer structure for, um, for how our system runs now, briefly, we just basically have a three, a three tier system. Um, so there's private insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, these are three examples of payers we have. So for private, insur private insurance, a lot, largely those will be profitable to hospitals and providers. So hospitals will reimburse above cost. Medicare generally is cost neutral. Um, is sort of the is sort of the barometer for for the cost of care. And Medicaid is sort of the spot where hospitals lose money. Um, and this is important because this illustrates that a lot of times you'll hear about um, about you know if we have Medicare for all or a universal health care program, we'll be rationing care. Um, and it just shows that we we do we do ration care. And the next slides will will hammer this point home a little a little more as well. But uh, most places in the world do ration care. I, I think every every healthcare system rations care. But for the most part, it's going to be rationed on medical needs. So, you know, the 60 year old uh, retiree who needs a knee replacement so he can go play tennis um, versus the 20 year old who works a physical labor job and needs a knee replacement, that their care will be rationed. The 20 year old will be higher up on that list. Um, but that's based on medical need. Whereas now our care is rationed, but it's based on things completely separate from our, our medical status and based on the type of insurance and payer, payer that we have. Um, all right, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. So this is another slide illustrating the same point. We're looking at the difference between um, public and private insurers and um, children who can see specialists. So just across the graph, we can see that the black boxes, which is the public insurance, it is just significantly lower than private insurance. So kids on public insurance cannot see specialists at the same rate that kids on private insurance can. Um, and this, this goes back to the three tier system we showed. So when a hospital is getting re reimbursed above cost with private insurance, they're, in, they're incentivized to seek out patients who have private insurance. Um, so because of this, providers and hospitals are forced to evaluate their patients pocketbooks. Hospitals want to bring in patients with private insurance. Um, so what do they do? They move into middle class or wealthier neighborhoods. They make their hospitals look more attractive. We've seen these hospitals that look like resorts, um, places that you would go on vacation. Um, and there's even hospitals where they have executive wings where patients with you know the highest of insurance can go stay in their own wing, get meals on white cloth tables. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a real dichotomy in care. And then also, these hospitals they see the pri they see the private insurance patients they they make more money they keep this money in house and they gain more they gain more power in the system by by um, utilizing this private insurance, and we just ju we juxtapose this with um, urban and rural hospitals across the country are closing. Um, these are hospitals that were largely trying to do the right thing, see patients that came through the door based on medical need, and they're struggling to keep their doors open. Um, so this is just an example around the Chicago area of patients of uh, hospitals that had to close. Um, from personal experience, one of the hospitals um, that medical students used to work at at Wright State, the school I go to, um, Good Sam, closed for the same reason. It was located in a lower income neighborhood, saw patients who largely were on public insurance and was not able to keep it doors, its doors open. So the key point from this slide is, um, you know, hospitals. Financial ability of hospitals is tied to the health, health insurance of patients they see, so they're more incentivized to seek out richer patients. Richer communities get healthier, poor communities get left with fewer and fewer options. And so I'll try to go quickly through this, but outcomes. <clears throat> so even though we have the costliest healthcare in the world and not everyone has access, our outcomes still don't match up. So it's I think it's important to start out with this graph because it shows that we are capable of excellent outcomes. So this is showing when people hit 65 and they switch on um, to um, Medicare, health outcomes improve. And we can be, you know, one of the top countries in the world when we're actually covering people. Um, and there's an, a, there's an example within the VA system as well, where if you look at it throughout the country, uh, even stratified by socioeconomic status, black Americans will have 
uh, lower health outcomes than their white counterparts, even within the same socioeconomic group. But when you look at veterans who are covered by the VA, a public health insurance, those disparities and outcomes completely disappear um, because these people are covered equally. So it just goes to show that we can refuse to accept a narrative that we can't do better um, because we within this country do better. Um, so this is kind of our shining light and the, the little nugget of hope we can hold on to that this is a man-made system we can do better in. And this is a slide just showing that we're, you know, we're, we're not doing great in comparison to our other countries with, you know, comparable economies where 19th, 35th, 25th in life expectancy. So, um, and another slide illustrating the same point, maternal mortality, one of the hallmark indicators of a healthcare system. If you're not taking care of mothers um, who should be able to access care, then it's very clear that there's something wrong in the country. So, as you can see, again, we love to be on our own in these graphs. We're just above and head and shoulders above these other countries with comparable economies. And I think it's just br briefly important to look at this data point and realize that um, this is an aggregate data point. And um, so if you look at the maternal mortality for you know wealthier white mothers, it's closer to 400,000. So closer down here to where Denmark, Finland, Italy, Sweden, down here towards the bottom of the graph. Um, so the fact that we're so high just speaks to the fact that our, um, you know, mothers of color who are in lower socioeconomic status, their outcomes are so poor that it's moving the entire graph all the way up, skyrocketing above everyone else. So just to, just to wrap up my my whole part, which is the, this is what it all comes down to. It's the ultimate sacrifice. There's estimates that 68,000 uh, people lose their lives annually due to lack of insurance, not due, not necessarily due to the, um, you know, health conditions that they're dealing with, but due to lack of insurance, to care deference, not being able to see the doctors they need to see. Um, and these are mostly young people because once you get to 75, you're covered by Medicare. So you're, you're, you're largely able to see the people you need to. So, and just to put this number sort of in a stark comparison, this is more people than die in car accidents per year. So it, it's, it's just a, it's just an enormous figure. It's it's you know it's hard to wrap your mind around, but this is what we're dealing with. Um, but Peter, I, I kind of gave the doom and gloom. Peter is about to come and uh, bring the the warm fuzzies when he talks about the path forward. So um, thank you guys for listening. I'm gonna hand it over to Peter now. Okay, thanks for that session. Um, so I think we all are sort of on the same page that we have a, a non system um, rife with perverse financial incentives uh, that delivers both sort of unequal care that rations care based on ability to pay that disproportionately affects communities of color and low income communities. Uh, and the result is that we have bad health outcomes. Um, and so what do we do about that? This is, this is the problem that we're faced with. And I think we're all here um, to try to look for, for that solution. So I'm going to focus this presentation on the logistics of that solution. I think the moral imperative and ethical imperative um, are sort of self-evident. Uh, so I will focus instead on kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what constitutes uh, our proposal uh, for, for single payer. And I, I should mention that Sachin and I are, are both uh, members of Students for a National Health Program, which is the student group of Physicians for a National Health Program. Uh, this has been a group that's been a single issue group advocating for single payer system in the United States since the 1980s and is pretty instrumental in um, uh, informing the, the current legislation at, at federal level. So, uh, first of all, you know, this, this effort has been branded as improved Medicare for all. So why do we say improved? Uh, and that is because Medicare is far from perfect. Uh, it ex excludes some things that should be self-evident, such as vision care, dental care, hearing care, um, and, and of course, long-term care, uh, which I think surprises some people, but it is not uncommon for, for folks as, as, they, as they age and need long-term assistance to deplete their entirety of their savings uh, and then qualify for Medicaid, which will cover long-term care. So in this way, you can look at our healthcare system as a way to uh, vacuum up uh, wealth from the middle class and sort of reinsert it into, into the financial system. Um, Medicare also has really costly cost sharing through premiums, co-payments, and deductibles. 
Uh, there's no part of Medicare that doesn't involve some degree of cost sharing. Um, so we need improved Medicare for all because we don't want private, uh, we don't need, want a requirement for supplemental private insurance. We want it to cover the care that people actually need. And we also need some structural improvements to ensure that it is financially viable to provide health care uh, on the provider's end. I think Sachin sort of went over the differential pay scales between private insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid. So what is single payer? Uh, it is a national health insurance program. Uh, this is important. It is not a national health provider program. So in the UK, they have the NHS, and this is where all health providers and all hospitals are either employed by or owned by the, the state. Um, what the proposals here in the United States are is that there is instead a single payer, and then uh, private institutions actually deliver that care. Um, it should be noted that right now about 30% of healthcare is provided for by for-profit institutions. Uh, this is something that I personally think is sort of morally uh, sort of an oxymoron, but that, that is what it is. Um, and uh, this bill would, the, the bills proposed would make those all be non-for-profit, but regardless, they would still be private institutions. Uh, it is a program that would cover everybody in the United States from birth until death. Uh, it would include all medical and mental health care required, including reproductive care, and it would have no cost sharing. Uh, as we've seen from Sachin's presentation, cost sharing uh, does serve to defer medically necessary care and does very little to contain the cost of care. So what are the benefits? Uh, we kind of went over this, but it will reduce costs. We'll go over how uh, a little bit later on, but a lot of this is going to become from increased efficiencies. So right now it takes an army of bureaucrats uh, to, to uh, manage the financially adversarial relationships that constitute our current healthcare system. Uh, and that would sort of be no more under a single payer system. In addition, it would permit the federal government to negotiate drug prices. Currently this is only done uh, by the Veterans Affairs Administration. There's no other entity that, that uh, federal entity that negotiates drug prices. Um, and it would incentivize a focus on public health measures uh, because there is sort of one entity that bears the cost of illness and would therefore uh, bear the financial benefit of health. Uh, it would also reduce physician burnout. Uh, the great resignation is a term to describe sort of in the COVID era a mass retirement of nurses, doctors, and other healthcare providers. Um, and even before COVID, we had some of the least healthy, sorry, some of the least happy doctors in the entire world. I think uh, second only, uh, second from the bottom in other wealthy nations. And this is largely a reflection of the uh, administrative morass that, that a lot of providers are expected to work in, spending time on prior authorizations, uh, notes that are nearly four times, four times as long as comparable uh, countries, um, and in an environment where we spend less time with patients, more time on the computer. So some more benefits. Uh, Choice. I think this is an important talking point is right now you have very little choice. You're restricted by the network of your insurance company. Your employer is going to restrict who your insurance is. Uh, but under this situation, pretty much every provider, every hospital would be a part of the single payer system and you would be free to choose where you want to go. So there's going to be more choice. There's going to be less financial ruin uh, and the care systems are going to be accountable to you not their shareholders or their board. Uh, and importantly also, it's good for business. So if there's any entrepreneurs in the room, there's a group called the Business Case for Medicare for All. Uh, but as Sachin showed in, in one of his slides, uh, the, the cost of, of healthcare for employees on business is rising far beyond inflation each year. It's a very unpredictable cost and it's a huge financial burden for these businesses. So being able to offload that and allow some degree of risk mitigation and predictability from year to year would be a huge benefit for, for businesses as well. Uh, so is there legislation? There is. Uh, it is H.R. 1976 in the House, introduced by Pramila Jayapal, who for the last several years has, has introduced the Medicare for All Act. There's 121 Democratic co-sponsors. This year, there is not Senate legislation. Uh, Bernie Sanders has introduced legislation uh, in the past, but his effort this year was more on COVID relief bills and sort of the healthcare components of the Build Back Better Act. Um, so let's talk about 1976. That's where we're going to focus the, the rest of this conversation. Um, so it includes all US residents, importantly, regardless of immigration status, comprehensive coverage, no co-pays, global budgets for hospitals, which is something that's uh, really important that we'll talk about a little bit later. And it provides for a two-year transition. 
Uh, this bill also improves on, on some of the previous bills, 1384 in the, in the year before, uh, that um, where there's a significant investment in, in health equity, a new office would be created for that. We'll go over that. Um, prohibition against future cuts, a few more covered benefits. And very importantly, in the age of COVID is there's uh, some contingencies in there to help prepare the nation and the healthcare system uh, for future public health emergencies. So um, just again, sort of reiterating some of these points, this, this bill would cover all medically necessary care, including the things you can see on the right hand side here. Uh, so, you know, importantly, mental health care, vision, dental, hearing, long term care. Um, and it would repeal the Hyde Amendment, which is a basically a fiscal rider that's passed each year that prohibits the federal government from spending any money on abortions, uh, the sort of limiting comprehensive reproductive care that are available to birthing people. So um, this bill would, would uh, remedy that situation. Um, so moving on, uh, and, and it, you know, it includes everybody in the country, which I think is, is really important that, you know, especially again, so many lessons from COVID that, that you know, we'll, we'll see if we learn, but hopefully we learn. Um, but, um, you know, communicable diseases don't care what your passport says or what your country of origin is. Um, we, are, we all share these physical spaces, we share our communities, and we want uh, the people who, who live in our communities, who, who we interact with on a daily basis, to be healthy, everybody benefits from that. And so a system that creates these arbitrary boundaries based on where you were born or what your immigration status is, doesn't address the, the collective reality that, that we all live in. Um, so there's everybody's covered, it's for your entire life. There's no denial for pre-existing conditions. Uh, and again, this choice thing, I think is an important talking point to make. Uh, you have a free choice of pretty much any doctor in any hospital. So uh, it eliminates out-of-pocket expenses, um, and this is great for patients. Again, it, it cannot be overstated that people, the, the, the effect of out-of-pocket expenses is the deferment of care. That's what it is. Uh, you know, there's a study a couple of years ago that about 50% of the country couldn't handle the $400 uh, surprise expense. And when you look at Medicare Part B and it's 20% coinsurance, I mean, healthcare bills are so outrageously expensive that a single MRI in San Francisco can get you to that to that forty percent, uh, to that four hundred dollars that fifty percent of the country couldn't afford. Um, for providers, it eliminates insurance company hassle. So these are things like prior authorizations, where you know what the best treatment is, but you have to call the insurance company and argue with them first, or fill out a bunch of onerous paperwork in order to get that covered. Uh, somebody in the in the chat talked about a their rheumatologist who will spend 45 minutes with them. And for a lot of folks who don't have that experience, um, one of the reasons is that your healthcare provider has to spend a good chunk of their time each day doing things like prior authorizations. Uh, another particularly insidious uh, aspect of, of current health insurance regimens is something called step therapy, where this is where they will not cover a more expensive therapy unless you have tried the less expensive ones first. So sometimes what this, this can mean is that an oncologist would be forced to, to prescribe sort of a futile round of chemotherapy using an outdated regimen, uh, not because they think that is the best choice medically, but solely for the purpose of then accessing the funds to pay for the, the superior choice. So I think we've all uh, either been through or known somebody who's been through chemotherapy. And the idea that for financial reasons, you would, you would put a patient through that, I think is pretty reprehensible. Um, and then again, we've, we've talked about the need to, to not have to purchase any additional insurance, uh, which is a huge problem with, with Medicare as it is right now. Um, so it makes it more affordable en masse, so on a large scale. So, um, you know, right now there's, there's uh, close to a million people who are employed sort of just in the billing end of an insurance company end of healthcare. Uh, hospitals have to you know, I think a famous example is, is uh, the Duke's Hospital has nearly one biller for every hospital bed. Um, it, it's been estimated that it costs ninety thousand dollars per physician just to manage the billing end of things, and these numbers are enormous. The amount of waste that it takes for for these sides that have adversarial financial relationships 
to, to try to extract money from each other or withhold money from each other. Um, I mean, this can't be emphasized enough. Keep in mind that one of the most uh, the main sources of profit for health insurance companies is investment revenue. So they take your premiums and they invest your premium. And so say you get really ill and you, you, you know, are in a terrible car accident or something like that. It doesn't take long for uh, six figure bills or even seven figure bills to be racked up. You know, it may be worth them just fighting, paying that out because the amount of time that that money spends on the market generating passive revenue will pay for the staff and paperwork just to kind of keep kicking the can down the road. I mean, something like 90%, 95% of health insurance initial denials are ultimately approved and paid out. And that system only makes sense when you, or that reality only makes sense when you look at the financial incentives where holding money generates money. Um, and so it's just ridiculous that we call this healthcare spending in this country when there's no care being provided when a health insurance company is, is paying a low level bureaucrat to fight with your hospital to hold the money back from, from paying for the care that you received. And yet we call that healthcare spending in the United States. Um, so it would, it would eliminate that reality at the moment. Uh, and additionally, it would allow us to negotiate for drug prices. So the VA currently pays about 40% less than Medicare Part D. Um, Medicare Part D, if you don't know, uh, is by federal law prohibited from negotiating for drug prices despite being one of the largest pur single purchasers of pharmaceuticals in the United States. Uh, this is a legacy of the Bush administration. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, but but that, those savings, when you talk about the, the 200 to three, 250 to $300 billion a year that are spent on healthcare, you know, you're taught that just that right there is, or sorry, that is spent on pharmaceuticals, just that 30 to 40% savings, you're talking about about $100 billion a year right there that could be saved. Um, a lot of people make the point that, well, what about research and development? Well, pharmaceutical companies spend a lot more on advertising than they do on research and development. The federal government and the NIH uh, and states through their, their universities are some of the biggest funders of research and development. And these drugs are sold in every other wealthy nation in the world. They still sell these drugs to the Veterans Affairs Administration, indicating that they think that there is some profit to be made from there as well. So really, there, there's not a credible case to be made that, that we're gonna be hamstringing the, the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry and the pipeline for new drugs. Um, and, and nor does it make sense that this profit-driven system should then be, it should be subsidizing all global pharmaceutical research and development. So I think that case, uh, when you start to pick it apart, really falls flat. Um, so, you know, okay, so let's talk about global budgeting. I think this is an important thing where Sachin talked about how these hospitals are able to keep the surpluses from, from all of the, the uh, revenue they generate. And this is part of the reason that COVID uh, created such a financial strain on hospitals is elective surgeries, which are an extremely profitable thing that they do, uh, were basically canceled during COVID. Um, and and that, um, that, that would created a huge financial strain for hospitals. So they are, they are incentivized to focus lucrative procedures, to have profitable services, to optimize billing. This is something that Sanchin and I are gonna have to deal with all the time and, and perhaps other people do as well, where, oh, you need to have this in your note and that in your note, and you need to make sure you describe it this way and not that way. And you start to interrogate why you're getting these instructions. And it's because our medical record, which uh, is purportedly a clinical document, is, is really uh, a billable invoice that then gets sent to, to a nondescript office building somewhere uh, and turned into to something that generates revenue for the hospital. Um, and so that's how hospitals get paid today. So you have wealthy hospitals thriving, forming huge conglomerates, buying up other hospitals. Uh, we basically have a, a monopoly-like uh, marketplace in a lot of large regions in the country um, because a small number of hospitals own uh, a huge swath of, of the, or a small number of hospital chains on a huge swath of the hospital beds in a region. Um, and then you have safety net hospitals um, basically struggling to survive from day to day. An example is that in Chicago, Northwestern University uh, typically has about uh, 800 or so days of cash on hand. So that means they could stop all revenues and continue to operate at the same rate for about 800 days. These are pre-COVID numbers, so I'm not sure if things have changed. Um, whereas Mount Sinai, which is a, a safety net hospital in Chicago's west side, 
typically operates with one to two days of cash on hand. Um, and, and so, you know, this is, this is, uh, yeah, this is just speaks to the disparities that our, our financing system creates today. So what, what a global budget would do is it would provide a hospital with an annual operating budget based on uh, predicted expenses for the year. Uh, and it would not allow them to keep any of the surplus. So it would allow the hospital to basically cover all their overhead and pay all their staff. Uh, and then the operating budget would be separated from the capital budget. And the capital budget for new investments, buildings, equipment, machine, what have you, uh, would be allocated based on regional need. So rather than a, a, a lucrative hospital being able to build a new tower to attract sort of out of country cash clients, uh, that regional body could look and say, well, hey, two miles away, we have dire need of a primary care office. And those types of decisions could be made with the medical needs of the community uh, rather than the financial incentives of a single actor. So uh, an important part of this as well is that it does provide an option for fee for service for individual providers. So this is for non-salaried providers. This is, so this is physicians, small physician groups, things like that. And you would basically be able to bill Medicare for the services that you provide in a streamlined, simple way. Uh, and I think this is really important because healthcare conglomeration has affected not just hospitals, but also um, individual family practice offices and GP offices throughout the country. Um, because for two reasons, one, it is so incredibly complicated to maintain a contract with the many health insurance, um, health insurances that operate in your area. And, and the other is that there's a lot of financial incentive to sort of be purchased or be a part of the healthcare system. I had a doctor a mentor at school tell me that he was offered double his current take home pay to keep all his patient panel, change nothing, to just work for this healthcare system in the Chicago area. And the reason they can do that is that all the referrals get sent back to the mothership. You need an x-ray, you get it at our facility. You need to go to the hospital, you come to our hospital. You need an MRI, it happens at our facility. You need to see one of our specialists, it's, it's in-house. And so it, it just changes the relationship between the, the provider and the patient, uh, where all of a sudden they are now an employee of a larger system that has a financial incentive in generating an inward flow of patients and is able to use that GP's uh, referral to, to um, justify that for, to insurance companies. So you end up with this, in, where you end up with a, a situation where, um, you know, a good a primary care physician, which Sachin and I would both like to be, the goal is to keep your patient out of the hospital. Uh, and, and I hope that I never work in a situation where the financial incentive of my employer is contradictory to my obligation to my patient. And I'm not trying to accuse any of the physicians who work in these settings of sort of violating their, their commitment to their patients. I'm just saying when you look at the position they're in and the structural incentives that surround them, uh, the contradiction becomes evident. Um, and so having a simple system where you can hang up a shingle in a community and not have to have enormous overhead to, to be able to just manage the billing will help bring individual small scale community level providers back into communities and make that a financially viable career path, uh, which is something that I personally would, would really appreciate over the course of my career. Um, so health equity, uh, just wanna check how we're doing on time here. Okay, I'll try to wrap it up here in the next minute or two. Uh, so the Office of Health Equity, uh, this is a new thing that's created in this bill. Um, it would publicly tra track health outcomes, address disparities, uh, you know, intervene on these disparities. Um, I think this is a really important change. We have really dramatic health disparities along a number of axes in the United States of America. And in addition, uh, I think just importantly, it preserves the Veterans Affairs Administration as is Indian Health Services and would make sure those nations uh, where those services are provided would have any input on changes there, and TRICARE, which provides care to active duty military in the U.S. and abroad. And we discussed it overrides the Hyde Amendment. Um, so these are some of the groups um, that it defines as, as uh, impacted by, by health disparities. Um, and finally, some of the benefits of this bill, uh, more mental health care, uh, more sort of ancillary services such as transportation, these bans on prior authorization and step therapy, uh, and then things like 365-day stockpiles of PPE. I mean, my classmates and I should not have been 
uh, calling auto body shops, trying to get them to donate leftover boxes of masks they had around so that we could take them to local hospitals in the start of March of 2020, but that's what we were doing. Um, and, and so, you know, I think this speaks for itself why, why we need that. Um, we kind of talked about this, so I'm gonna skip this slide here. Uh, I think this is important. Another important political point uh, is there are about 800,000 people who would be expected to lose their jobs uh, if we transition to a single payer system. And these are people insured by insurance companies, excess billers at hospitals, things like that. Uh, this is a lot of folks. These are innocent workers. I think they need to be tended to, but just because a immoral sort of costly system that's bankrupting the nation and causing you know, incalculable harm to people's health creates a lot of jobs is not justification for its perpetuation. Uh, but we do need to care for these workers. Um, and so a couple important notes, about 20 million people change jobs each year. So 800,000 additional folks is about a four to 5% increase in the number of people that turn over jobs each year as is, not a very dramatic increase. In addition, 1% of the budget would be set aside for the first five years to help these folks out. 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in the order of four, four and a half trillion dollars per year, uh, that is quite a lot of money. That's like uh, $250 billion or something, $200 billion over this five year period of time. Uh, okay, and it would roll in over two years. Um, basically, uh, the first year it expands Medicare to the necessary services. The second year it starts to tighten the age group and allows people to buy in, uh, or sorry, the first full year. And then after the second year, everyone's covered. I am gonna skip the next slide, which goes into a sort of more detailed implementation of what these two years would look like. Uh, and again, this, these slides are just gonna reiterate some things we've talked about. It covers everybody, it covers everything. It actually gives you meaningful choice in healthcare, which means choice of your provider and your hospital. Uh, it reduces costs, it reduces healthcare spending, and it improves health equity. So it's simple. And that, that is the, the key thing here is that it streamlines the system in a way where the incentives match the reality and the needs of society. So finally, um, we will very quickly look at how we pay for this. Uh, I think it is important to note that 1976 is not a fully self-funding piece of legislation. So what we're gonna talk about now um, are a little bit more theoretical. Um, so a lot of studies, I think something on the order of like 20 studies have looked at a single payer system um, and pretty much all of them have found there will be some degree of savings. This is a very conservative estimate, um, the, the estimates range, uh, but there will be some more healthcare expenses. That's good because a lot of healthcare is deferred right now. So more healthcare expenses is appropriate, um, but that will be offset by savings in total system administration uh, on the order of a couple hundred billion dollars per year, pharmaceutical pricing also in a similar order um, and a few smaller things. So, you know, estimates range 200, 500, 700 billion dollars a year would be saved um, through a, a single payer system. I mean, even the RAND Institute, which ideologically is not aligned with single payer at all, has admitted that there would be savings in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year uh, if we rolled out a system like this. So again, this just shows that having a national health system does save costs. You can see we were tracking right along with Canada, 1972, Canada implements the system and we pull widely away from them uh, as a percent of GDP. Um, we talked about this, but it, 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 I, this is sort of getting into the weeds a little bit, um, but it is true that new funds, would, new federal funds will need to be raised in order to pay for this system. But what is important to note is that money is being spent in the economy as is. So you're, if you get employer-sponsored health insurance, your employer is spending thousands of dollars per year. I mean, it's like something like 15 or $20,000 per family of four in premiums to a health insurance company right now. So you eliminate that, you create a lot of space for payroll taxes. So we are not talking about new funding in the economy. We are talking about a rearrangement in how healthcare money gets spent. Um, but it is true that significantly new funds would have to flow into Treasury Department coffers uh, under a single payer system. Uh, HR 1976 doesn't delineate how that would be done, although it does have some sort of funding specific language in it. Um, 
But there are a lot of different proposals. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders in his 2020 campaign had a relatively detailed proposal for how that would be done. This is another one that's sort of been used as a model a lot from 2013. But suffice it to say, uh, it is not difficult to arrange these proposals such that 95% of the population will see their take home pay increased and, and some quite significantly. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the point that this would raise taxes on people is a spurious claim because it would lower costs and increase take home pay. And I think that's a really key point that we are not talking about new, fun, new money being spent in the economy. We are talking about streamlining how that money is spent. And this can easily be done in a progressive way that increases take home pay. Um, so let's see how we're doing here. Okay. I think the, the last thing I'll say about this is we, we had a quick slide about other proposals, such as the public option, Medicare buy-in, Medicaid buy-in, Medicare for America. Um, I won't spend much time on these. I think the important thing to note is they don't solve the problem. They introduce new payers into the mix. Um, and some of these payers might be you know, better for individual people or things like that, but they don't solve the problem of an incredibly complicated healthcare system rife with perverse financial incentives, both on behalf of insurance companies and on large healthcare institutions. So only Medicare for all does that. Um, and I think it's important to note that just making things more complicated is not addressing what is really driving these disparities and these sort of uncontainable costs that we see. So that is our presentation. Um, just, just in time here. I think we have like a minute or two left if anybody has any questions, uh, but I wanna thank everybody for joining today. Thank you guys. Thank all of you. I hope you have a great conference.